Good morning, everyone. This is a <laughs> special, special moment. Special panel, really. Uh, we haven't seen the heads of the uh, six families uh, gathered together since that famous scene of The Godfather uh, uh, done by uh, uh, Francis Ford Coppola so long ago. So welcome, gents. I, uh, we, don't have any, um, we don't have any lawyers here. We can talk freely. You're among friends, and we can really get into some, uh, we can really get into some good issues here today. Uh, a couple of things about the way we're going to run this panel today. Some of you have seen me moderate. We're going to have some fun. We're going to try to answer a bunch of questions. Uh, there's some pads and paper in the back. If, if for some reason you'd like to uh, uh, see if you could submit a question, write it down, and somebody will bring it up, and I'll see if I can add it to the, uh, to the list. And we're going to try to keep things moving rapidly and cover a lot of, uh, a lot of ground. <laughs> this is a rare moment because I'm not sure this group will ever be gathered together again. Uh, we have um, people here who have helped create the media services revolution. We have uh, uh, people that, Jack, I think you've just announced uh, your retirement, right? So Correct. this will be one of the last times that we'll be uh, uh, together on a panel. And I, I guess I'd like to start with, uh, with you, if you don't mind. You were one of the guys that really helped create the freestanding media agency. You, uh, I think Bill is way too generous to call me the architect. You perfected it. You invented it. You were part of creating it. Are you happy? Are you happy the way it all turned out? Is this the way you wanted the media services revolution to turn out? <laughs> He's retiring. Does that say it all? Yeah, I'm very happy about how it turned out. Uh, I guess what I'd say, David, first of all, I was, uh, as part of, back then, uh, Starcom and then with Erwin, Starcom MediaVest, uh, we were, uh, I guess I was the last into this club, and I'm the first out. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, I, again, I think there's plenty of credit for people who elevated the role of media uh, in this industry, and, there are, and many of them are sitting here. And like I said, we were, we're, we were really in that time, back in 1997, a fast follower. Uh, there's benefit in being a fast follower. I could see the trials and tribulations that my peers had to face as they created their media businesses. Uh, we saw early on that being a media buying operation at that time alone wasn't enough, that we needed to uh, be a more full service. We needed to incorporate <coughs> strategy and planning as part of our proposition. Uh, so I think we did all that. Um, I think that we had to, at the end of the day, I think we sat here two or three years ago and we talked about not putting the toothpaste back in the tube. Uh, I still believe that. I think the notion of, of rebundling is, uh, you know, is not appropriate. Uh, at the same time, I think all of us felt, at, there was a phrase that we used back in the late 90s when we all spun off that I often remembered called, uh, we needed to, uh, to, uh, to separate, to integrate. Uh, it was really important, I think, for the media departments of that time of the agencies to, uh, step up and uh, manage themselves as a business, self-fund their own resources, and become a better overall partner to the marketing communications process. And I believe that's what we did. Uh, I guess so I'm very happy. Now, I'll be even happier that as I look from, uh, you know, as an interested bystander, that this group and the media agencies uh, that are represented will take the next step and lead into the spirit of collaboration that was talked about so much yesterday. I totally buy into it, I totally believe it. And just as we led in other areas in the past decade, I really hope that it's the media agencies uh, that will step up and act as the, uh, the premier collaborators with other agency disciplines, with other outside partners that Rashad referred to yesterday, and nothing would make me happier. How about, uh, I'm not going to ask all of you uh, that same question, but I will <laughs> defer to you, Erwin. You also were one of the architects of the media services revolution. Are you happy the way this all turned out? Is this really what you dream? You know, I don't think any of us in the early mid-90s could have anticipated what's evolved. Um, the truth of the matter is we can't, any of us, take credit for having been the architects of it because this, at least in my case, was driven by my clients who wanted more focus on media, who were becoming alarmed. You know, people forget that media is consolidated at one agency, right? And yet many FMCG clients continue to retain four, five, six creative shops. 
And several of our clients, and they happened to be very big and um, they, they were big and they were influential clients, uh, they came to the agency and said, look, we're not entirely comfortable having the media operation, which has 80% of its business no longer uh, overlapping the agency's business, reporting up through the agency lines. And a holding company was formed and media got separated, and all we did was execute. Okay. But as I said at the outset, I don't think any of us could have anticipated the scope of the business, the globalization of the business, the complexity of the business, the fact that almost all the quantitative practices wound up housed in the media agencies. And um, it is what it is, but it's part a reflection of the increasing complexity of the media landscape. Uh, and it just takes more brain power, more effort to get the job done today than it did 15, 20 years ago. And our scale reflects that. Yet, you know, I look at this and I say, it's, uh, here we sit at the end of the revolution and there's, uh, you know, seven white guys up on the stage. I mean, what does that say about, uh, what does that say really about about where we are. Why are there uh, why, why, why is there just seven white guys sitting up on this stage? Says we one of us better get off fast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let, let's move to a different. Let's move to a different area now. Nigel Morris, my colleague from. Uh, you know, I'm just gonna. We uh, one of our agencies, Maxis. Yes. Um, just appointed a new global CEO as Kelly Clark moved into his Group M North America role. Fantastic. The new CEO at Maxis is Indian. And he is based in India. Terrific. Okay, okay good sign. And we didn't do that as a statement. We did it because the gentleman happens to be particularly talented. But I, I think those days are kind of behind us as well. Good. Uh, Nigel, let's turn to you. Um, why don't we start with, uh, with the news of, uh, of the sale to Dentsu. So here we have an agency, Aegis, a media-only um, enterprise that gets built into a global company and is sold to Dentsu for six billion dollars, something like that, roughly, give or take a uh, few hundred million here or there. I think I'm pretty close to six billion. Um, <laughs> tell us for a second about, you know, should we, if you just look at what you've done, and you look at, uh, at Dentsu making a huge move, first time one of the great agencies of all time, uh, housed in, in Japan, makes the decision to spend $6 billion to buy Aegis, deal's about to close, they have no in creative entanglements, they have no geographic uh, uh, conflicts with this move, and they have an agency leader who's six foot 11. Should we be frightened? <laughs> um. I think I think um, I think Dentsu it, 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 don't underestimate how big a move it is for them um, because obviously you know they're they're incredibly well established in Japan uh, they have a very interesting business model in Japan and uh, and very innovative in the way that they've embraced convergence embraced uh, technology and when they've made investments outside of Japan uh, they've tended to be um, quite selective uh, and, and nurturing, I think, over the last, certainly over the last five years, and they've learnt from some of the mistakes of the past. Um, you know, but this is obviously a very, very much a step change for them, um, and it's by far and away, you know, the biggest deal they've done, you know, by a factor of, you know, probably nearly ten. There's an enormous amount of complementarity between our businesses in terms of geography and in terms of services. Um, and, and outside of Japan, their main focus has been around uh, creative and Gary Bowen, uh, around digital where there is um, a, a little bit of crossover with 360i and obviously we have iSpar and we have iProspect. Um, but what I think it does say is um, it, it, it speaks again to the importance of media. Uh, it, it, it speaks to the, the reinvention of our industry and the fact that media uh, and, and especially as media and digital become closer and closer together, 
uh, how important that is to the future of marketing. Because, um, you know, Erwin talked about, you know, the pressure from, from clients. Over the last three or four years, all clients have been looking at about the fact that, you know, the point of transaction and the point of uh, engagement are getting closer together. That we're moving away from those proxy measures of marketing and media into real business outcomes. And I think that's it. I think, you know, to say, you know, that the industry should be frightened and my colleagues should be frightened because dents are coming, if you like. I, I think that uh, the whole industry has a lot to gain by leaning into convergence, mm. by really, really focusing on the consumer, what the consumer is doing, and how we can actually use media and use the tools that are now at our, uh, at our disposal to genuinely show what marketing can add. Uh, and, and, and I think that um, Dentsu and ourselves, as we will come together, will be, a, will be a force for change and a force for good in the industry. And that's mm. what I certainly hope. It's exciting. It's I, just, I just want it on the record Please. that tall people don't frighten me. <laughs> six foot 11. <laughs> Tim Andre. Six foot 11. He's, He's a very nice Japanese. Man. That's something. Um, let's move next to you, Mr. Koningsberg. Uh, you have been ha you've had an incredible last couple of years. You've really, if you look at what you've done with Horizon, from building probably the most impressive offices of, uh, of any media agency, I think, in the world, really. It's a beautiful space you've created you. and invested in. Um, you've been winning a ton. You think about the, uh, you know, the victory you've had with, uh, with Capital One, uh, as well as a bunch of other clients. Your agency manages Geico, perhaps the most visible campaign in America today. Um, and, uh, and you're on pins and needles waiting for maybe uh, some news on a, on a car account out in the West Coast. Uh, you have been winning. So two questions for you. Why have you been winning? Why has Horizon been winning? And is this really a panel or is this a job interview for you? <laughs> so th first of all, thank you for those compliments, David. And if you think for a second I'm going to spill the beans in terms of why we've been winning in front of these cutthroat <laughs> competitors, you're, you know, you're crazy. But, but a couple of things. Um, I, you know, I think that uh, one significant investment in tools, technology, and talent, and, and, and that's what it takes to win today. And that's very expensive, These are enormously expensive investments. Yesterday we talked an awful lot about talent, and, and you look at the talent that's sitting at, you know, up here, and the talent that you have to nurture within your agency, and, and, and that's what leads us. So I think talent is critical. Investment in tools, you know, when you talk about business science and business intelligence and predictive models and uh, integration and convergence of all the media that's out there today, you have to have a robust set of tools to lead, and I think we've done a good job at, at, at that, and then investment in technology. You know, you talked about the space, the environment. Um, people want to come to work at a place that is an experience today, not, not just an office. And I think that we've built out an experience for our people that allows them the freedom, the creativity to think and collaborate, which is critically important. So there is no, honestly, isn't any one single answer. It's a, it's a combination. As you know, it hasn't been a, a, a sprint. It's been a, it's been a journey over a period of, of time. And very proud of, of what we built. Um, you know, you mentioned something about the revolution. Mm -hmm. I think the revolution is just starting, mm -hmm. really do. And I think the future is incredibly bright and probably more exciting than ever before for the industry in terms of what we do. Um, let's go to you next, uh, Matt. Um, talk a little bit for about, uh, uh, answer this question. As I travel around and I meet people in the industry, particularly for media sales, particularly people that are selling to, to your organizations, but I'll, let's, let, let's, let's talk about, uh, use yours as an example. I hear from people selling media time and space frustration. Frustration with your organizations. Um, that your organizations are focused on RFPs, that there's unanswered phone calls, that there's you know, silos, centers of excellence, but that you can't get good ideas, innovative ideas through organizations that are this size. For the people out here 
who are in the sales business, Matt, give them some advice as to how do you call on an organization your size? How do you bring new ideas to your company? How do you, if you're a salesperson, give these folks some ideas on how to sell better, how to bring ideas, and how to do business with big media agencies? Um, we are complicated. You know, we just restructured to help with that. We have so many P&L silos in our world, and you all deal with that all the time. You know, our digital team, which we pretend is fully integrated, yet we have people that are in charge of digital. So we have all these names, logo soup, confusing as hell. Um, so we need to be better at just, it's one p and in our world, so you have to be recognizing that our business is about serving our clients' business. So you as salespeople need to be better at bringing ideas that are client-oriented, not media ideas so much. You know, there's a tendency to come in and deal with probably too junior a person in our organization and to bring a very, very media-driven, generic, you know, try to sell it to Irwin, try to sell it to Bill, you know, just everything looks and feels the same. So really think about it from a client perspective, <clears throat> excuse me, from a business building perspective, <clears throat> and go high enough into our organization that you can pass over the dumb, siloed p and world. <laughs> Yeah. How about you? Uh, I'd like to hear, uh, Alan, uh, why don't you go next? I'm also interested in talking to you, because if, if you think about this panel, you represent the next generation, the next generation of people that are in leadership of the, of the industry. And you, know, you have an unbelievable reputation. You've done a fantastic job. So talk about that. Talk about how people can call on your company and sell better ideas and solutions, but also talk about the, the people behind you. How are you feeling about the level of talent in the, in the industry, in your company? How good are the people behind you? Well, I mean, to that point, thank you for the compliments. Uh, the first thing I would say is that people make the difference. It's the biggest part of what Bill said when he said tools, technology, and people. People win business. People are the reason that separates Omnicom, Omnicom Media Group, OMD from everybody else. And, and everybody can hire everybody else's people and try to duplicate that. To the, to the process we were talking about, how do you get ideas through. I was a client for 20 some years and I hated the fact that I could never have that direct relationship. So what I did is we tried to build our agency on the fact that we could create a catalyst group that you could bring your ideas to and they could get it to everybody. So this idea of having to go to every client team and work at the lowest level is so frustrating for all of us up here I'm sure. We hate the RFP process. We hate that we send them out and that we say you have a day to do it, and we hate that we all get back the same thing that everyone in all of our organizations ask for. But it is a, the power of the idea, the power of analytics. Look, we build up a big analytics group with Analect for, at Omnicom Media Group. We have a big a, innovation area called Ignition Factory. We have some of those folks here. That group cuts through the clutter, brings ideas to the clients, and helps us make media the most important part of marketing, which I think is what we all really believe, or we wouldn't be doing it. Yeah. And how about the talent hey, behind you? How do you the, feel about the talent behind you? The talent, the talent behind me is, uh, is fantastic. I think that it's been really hard to kind of create a team. We have a team now that's organized well across the, across the group and across OMD that covers all these spaces. We're finding, I think, and I think a lot of everybody up here would agree, that we're finding that the kind of people that we're able to recruit now, many of them have not spent their careers in media. Many of them come from other places. but. In this whole world where the ad dollar is the most important thing to a lot of our advertisers, you know, we're finding it attracts a lot more talent than it used to. I mean, of course, when people try to leave and there's turnover everywhere, you know, media agencies are not easy. There's a lot of day-to-day -day work, but we've tried to amplify and elevate it with all these new thinking. And we surrounded it so much with, as I like to say, we tried to create a big edge. And so the edge became so big that the edge became the thing. But we're trying to build a marketing company. I think that's where we all sit, where it's we're all working for. David, ahead, can I, I, I just want to add a comment about the, the, your, the good question about the sales thing and, and build on what Matt said. It's, it's a tough deal. I mean, everyone in this audience, all our people, you know, they work 28 hours a day. Uh, there's just not enough time to see everyone you need to see. I, you, know, you, you go in the auditorium, you see you know, newer, younger startup businesses who are out there working very hard to provide potential solutions to age-old problems we have in, the, in, in our industry. My only advice, and I've been thinking hard if I, if, my, uh, if I were in their position, my suggestion is 
is to focus on a, accounts, re, uh, focus on accounts through the agencies. Don't work around the agency, but focus on a couple of accounts uh, and listen to them. Provide ideas to a couple accounts, and that once you get a beachhead established, you have a success. All of our folks are quick to replicate success. So, and it passes virally in our organization. So, my advice is be smart, identify key accounts, focus on them, listen to them carefully, give them ideas. The second thing I'd have to say is give them scalable ideas. That's the, I mean, that's the problem in this fragmented industry. Our clients look at it, they go, boy, these are all really neat, but they're just not big enough to move the sales needle. So, I think when you start ideating, ideating with our folks on these accounts, They've got to keep in mind how big the idea must become. And then the last one I really wanted to share was, not my idea, but it always sounded like a good one. When, when Lisa Weinstein first came over to SMG and I had a chance to, to re-meet her again, she had an idea that we needed some kind of online automated approach. Uh, maybe it's a supercharged RFP. The intent of the RFP is honest enough, but it's, the execution is rather uh, impersonal. Uh, but somehow to have a mechanism, an online mechanism where we can, where our people can easily access, this is what this company is about, this is who's in charge, et cetera, et cetera. But more importantly, kind of like the glass door, there's got to be an opportunity for those who ex are exposed to those businesses, they have a chance to say, hey, these are good guys, this is a big idea, these guys are schmucks, They're, this is a, t don't waste your time. And there's got to be an opportunity to have that kind of online social community to use as a facilitating device to try to see so many of these very interesting and younger startup businesses. Uh, and I'd only put it forward. Uh, Mike Donahue and I have had conversations that this is a, a four A's initiative uh, to take this on. Uh, it strikes me as you know, knowing Media Link's capacities, and, and, and maybe this is something that I can throw on Michael's lap as a as an interesting little business, but I think we need some kind of mechanism that is going to allow us to get exposed properly to these new businesses that have new and interesting ideas, but there's only so much time in the day and you Got just it. can't see them all in person. Got it. Hey, hey David, can sure. I just, just go, go back one quick thing to what Alan said about talent, and, mm -hmm. I, and I don't want to sugarcoat it because I think the industry is on very thin ice. And I'm not talking about at the leadership at the you know, second level or third level within an organization, but we're on very thin ice in terms of the new people that we are bringing into the industry. And uh, turnover rates, one to two years in the industry are abysmal, 30 to 40 percent of people who leave the industry. And if this industry, and we held an enormous, enormous head seat at the table now in terms of what we drive the economy with in terms of what we do and the clients that we represent. If this industry doesn't do something about the abysmal entry-level salaries within the industry, and, and you know we're all free to do what we want to do, but there's so much pressure in terms of delivery. You talk about kids working 28 hours a day. We need to bring more diversity into the industry. We need to figure out how to right-size in terms of, of, of paying more for these entry-level people. We should be competing for the best minds in the industry. When people come out of Harvard or, or you know, the, the, the Ivy League schools, we want them to come into our industry. And I think it's an industry problem that needs to be resolved, and we can do it. We've got the power to do it. Maybe, maybe the 4A should do a brief and suggest that people come up with an ad to solve that problem. That's, that's very true. Challenge very, given it's, yesterday. It's, you know, it's, it's very it's, true. It's, it's actually, very true. But it's, it's actually it's, much deeper than just marketing, Matt. It's, I mean, you know, we've traditionally, all of us recruited from communication schools. And if you think about it, kids who go in to study communications, maybe studying journalism, maybe studying, maybe going to communication schools because they don't want to do quantitative work. And yet they wind up with us, right? And we need a combination of people who can do ideation, do creative work from that standpoint, and do the heavy lifting and the crunching because we have converged with technology. And I don't think any of us have done a good job in that regard. 
the industry as a whole has done a really terrible job. I, mean, I, I would agree. I would agree. I would with just that. say that coming from the client side, you expect that advertising agencies are going to have some level of turnover. We hire so many people out of college. You're not really expecting that those people are going to stay. I'm sorry that Bill has so much turnover in those beautiful Not offices. mine. I'm not referring. We're, <laughs> yeah, you know, having great success. I got to tell you, man. People, people are running to us. They're flocking to us. <laughs> best, best place to work two years in a row by ad age. We're recruiting, by the way. So not a problem with me. Boy, Bill. I'm just trying to help the industry. I'm That's, just trying uh, to oh, lift oh, your yeah, guys' game. Thank you. Thank you. All right? Thank you. That's what that. I'm trying to do. Yeah. Never, yeah. never stop That's selling, Konigsberg. <laughs> never stop selling. I love that. Um, let, let's keep going, and we have a bunch of other uh, things to cover. I want to keep this moving. There's so many things. This is such a rare moment to get you guys up here on stage. Let's do a couple other things. I'm going to ask a tough question to you, Nigel. Um, uh, GM is yep. the biggest win in the history of the advertising business, a global consolidation of the General Motors account. Yep. I believe it's the largest win in history. Um, it was said correct this misperception, it was said that transitioning the GM business to Cara was extremely difficult and was a challenge. Half your staff in Detroit used to work for Jack. Was this really, Joe Lewanek is gone. Is this really change what you've done with GM or was it really just a fee negotiation? And second, does the future look like GM and Cara? Is the future global businesses like GM of consolidating with one agency? Uh, so two things. Uh, the only thing that will, you know, the only thing that will out over time will be the truth. Um, uh, I think that we've made a dramatic change in the way that GM have done business, uh, a dramatic change in the way that they handle communications and media and the importance of media in their business. Um, I think that it was an incredibly brave move for them to go from multiple, multiple agencies around the world uh, into one. Uh, and clearly, uh, their decision has been mirrored uh, over the last 12 months by an increasing uh, centralization and consolidation around media contracts for global businesses. Uh, uh, the, you know, every single client who operates on a multi-market basis is facing, facing very significant challenges of having not just to, to do uh, the US, European top five and the BRICS. They're looking at the next 20, the sources of growth in the future uh, uh, are across multiple brands, multiple regions, uh, multiple markets. And they need to drive that consistency in a world that's very interdependent and transparent. So, um, I think that the, the transition, if you ask GM, would say in the circumstances was done with excellence. Um, uh, you know, the handover wasn't necessarily easy, but they were, it came from, again, it's not, you know, everyone focuses on the US, but around 50 agencies into one agency. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, most of, the, most of the people on the panel are representing global networks. Uh, and everyone is seeing that what they have to do is drive consistency for global brands uh, and in, uh, at the same time as drive innovation around convergence. And to, to echo, uh, I think, some of the points that, that Bill and Matt were saying, uh, uh, you know, what we, uh, and Erwin actually, that actually our industry hasn't done a very good job in terms of organizational design. You know, they haven't done a very good job in flattening out agency structures in encouraging new talent and different kinds of culture right, to, to actually really foster innovation from young people. And it's the 23, 24, 25 year olds who have multiple choices about where they, where they're going, where they, where they want to sp spend their career. It's a very, very different career structure than we had when we were growing up, if you like. You know, apart from Alan, of course, who's solved everything. Um, uh, not you know, that all much of us. Uh, uh, I'm not really. I'm happy to yeah, say I'm not, not really. Uh, much yeah. Thanks. All, you know, all of us are grappling <laughs> with complex issues. You know, and but as an industry, you know, we we have to really take organisational design more seriously. Got it. Let me. Uh, I, 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 I was going to ask you add, the next question. Well, I, I just want to add one last point to that, and that is, by the way, you didn't answer the second half of the question, but we'll <laughs> let you off that. Um, so. 
to, to some extent, the, the way we serve as a client no, I don't. assignment has to mirror that client's own organization. And some clients focus on global centricity. Yes. And uh, they want consistent global strategy. And they have a structure that allows for that. And that allows us to do great global work for them. We have other clients who sort of sit back and say, you know, PL responsibility sits in the local market. And if those guys have PL responsibility, they get to call their own shots. And we can be the lattice work around their structure. Yes. But we can't reshape them into something that they're not. Mm. And so there is no one size fits all solution here. Understood. But, but actually, that's the brave thing that GM did. That's the yes, really brave thing that they did was actually say, by centralizing their media and their communications, they can drive that consistency across those P&Ls. And, and that is what people are grappling with in terms of organizational yeah. design, because yeah. I agree with that. Okay, let's move to a different, let's move to a different subject. I'm gonna just, I want you to shake your heads if you agree that all of you, do all of you believe that a client, that the client's business comes first? Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. You all agree with that, right? Yeah. Then um, I'm gonna start with you, Erwin, if that's the way you feel. <laughs> <laughs> Then where do you stand on transparency? If, that's, if clients come first, then how can trading desks be fair to your clients? Okay. So. Notice he started with Erwin. So, <laughs> well, well, you've been one of the great advocates of, yeah, no, of, no. of, of uh, arbitrage. Uh, transparency is absolutely of the essence. We have to be transparent with a client on what our business model is and we have to execute that way. Having said that, it doesn't say in Genesis that everything we do has to be on a fully disclosed basis to clients. We are all in a position where we have to make massive investments in technology. Those investments don't lend themselves to recruitment through overhead charges of two or three hundred percent. Clients won't accept that. We have to compete with parties who are venture funded, private equity funded, where profitability isn't an issue. We, we have to be able to run an organization that uh, can develop technology, build data structures, exploit it for the benefit of their clients. And there are times, and for many clients, it is absolutely acceptable to be transparent and yet have a business model that is different from a straight commission or a straight fee. Okay? It is always about transparency on the business model. We are SOX compliant. We have always been. And SOX requires that level of transparency. I, I, just, I have to say, <clears throat> I have a thing about air quoting. You don't really need to air quote. Your facial expression does that for you. Came from texting. Stop air quoting. But I love that Irwin, when he said transparency, air quoted. That's beautiful. It's not transparent. It's either transparent or it's not. It's not sort of transparent. We are totally transparent. We don't arbitrage at all. Don't believe in it. Um, there are clients of not yours specifically necessarily, but of other people up here who say, we just don't understand how it can be that our agency thinks that our money is their money. We couldn't be farther on the extreme from that. All bespoke, all individual client, all totally transparent. You know, it helps that IPG went through a few restructure uh, restatements, so we are ridiculously squeaky clean, but um, opposite end of the chair and belief structure. Of Mr. Clues, you want to talk at all about transparency? Your agency is 100% transparent, isn't it? Yes, we are. But I, what I would say... Air, air quotes or no air quotes? No air quotes. Um, yeah, Everybody? Let me say two things. It, it, it's clear, yeah, our, our model in the, in the DSP programmable space is not the same as, as Group M. That's a fact. And probably is more aligned to where, to where Matt's talking. But, you know, and that's a philosophical difference. But where I would align with Irwin is we need to identify transparently, no air quotes, <laughs> Mm -hmm. other models of remuneration 
if we are to continue to serve our clients as well as possible. Totally. Because right now, guys, we are in a dangerously risky downward spiral totally. in this FTE cost deal that, you know, you know, God bless procurement people. I'm not debating their need. Uh, I'm just asking for some, ba I think we all would just like some balance in those approaches. But at the end of the day, you know, it is what it is. It's supply and demand. And I think maybe there's a few too many of us and too few advertiser dollars and clients to chase and we're gonna get squeezed. So the only way you can continue to be a vital business and a vital partner to your clients is to, ex is to explore alternative models. All I would say is we do that with, you know, and I think everyone would explore those models with transparency, no air quotes. Okay. So yeah, I think you gotta s separate, for me, um, Group M's approach to programmable versus maybe ours, but the intent I appreciate. I think you also have to I, look at what's happening over the next five years, which is the business could be evolving into two buckets. One that's all thought leadership, consulting ideas, and making big data, big idea driven, because big data on its own probably just sits there. But on the other side, it is the programmatic buying, and how can we get the best business building results with transparency, nobody, everybody wants a base level of tonnage to get their business done if you're a large client and then they also are driven by big ideas that actually drive their sales and build their business on top of that i and mean you alan, can do both. alan just hit a key thing if it doesn't perform yep. don't buy it mm -hmm. in, in, in the end it's going to be about outcome more and more every single day that goes past we're going to be more and more accurate about measuring the outcome against every dollar that is spent Understood. and it doesn't matter what uh, and how you affect that it is what is the business result that the hundred million or the five dollars actually buys? There, there's yeah. one last really critical point, no and I'm going to urge everyone on our side of this business to not be naive about the subject. Transparency is is something no one can argue about. But when you look at business models, we live in a world today where many of our media vendors collect data mm -hmm. and exploit that data for the benefit of their own yield management. It is our responsibility to build technologies that allow us to exploit data for pricing benefit to our client. Yep. That's not about transparency or non-transparency. It's not about disclosure or, or non-disclosure. It has to be transparent. The business model has to be completely transparent. But we have to build data structures. We have to build technologies. We have to be informed so that we can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with vendors who are extremely well informed and achieve pricing objectives for our clients. That, that is absolutely and, right. And to argue that point is to be absolutely naive. And, and that's absolutely right. And to be brave enough to follow through and make choices. That's right. That is, let's I, keep I, moving. That's Just, that, that's, we could have a terrific, I'm glad we got to that subject. It, 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 it's going to be coming up maybe later. Let's just get to, we only have a few more minutes left. Let's just get to a couple last questions. Um, Matt, I'm going to go to you with, if you think about the media services revolution, CARA started in 1998. So we're 15 years past the start of CARA. Uh, uh, when CARA came to the United States. Um, uh, and I talked about how the revolution has ended. We're now at the end of the revolution. Are we happy? There's perhaps the next generation media agency is about to be born. And, and, and many of you, you know, are different phases of that evolution. Does the next generation media agency look more like AKQA, RGA, and Digitas? Or does the next generation media agency look more like Martin, Goodby, and BBD&O? Uh, What's the next generation media agency look like? So I, I hope the answer is yes. Like I, I think that you pointed out that we're a bunch of old, except for Alan, who is old too, white guys <laughs> sitting up here. The fact that we all look the same is the problem. So I'm really looking forward to a media brand solution looking totally different from a Group M solution, looking totally different from a SMG solution, 
the fact that we have media agency fathers all talking the same stuff is dull. So I want to have a very different molecular structure. And I think that there should be agencies that have more of a direct focus and some that are incredibly technology oriented and some that are wildly social that we can't all look and feel exactly the same way. So ours will be um, more on the content side. Ours will be definitely tied to pay for performance, um, but theirs should be whatever they want theirs to be. I, I would just add that I don't really think that any of those agencies you mentioned are the future single agency. I think that media has taken this power of the ad dollar and become the center of conversation today for all of us up here and how they come back together. Already our clients and many of them at, at Omnicom clients have 10 to 15 different agencies that, that that toothpaste is out of the tube or the cat is out of the bag. The fragmentation that we face makes it so much harder to connect with consumers that I'm not sure you can put it back in the bottle and say it's all going to be with one agency. We're going to try to scoop up as much as we can and become that marketing consultant where we can to be advisors on how to spend your money the best, to connect with consumers the best. But that, that future agency doesn't exist, or it looks like somebody that's sitting up here. I, I think, the, only, I think the only thing I would say, and build on and maybe what Matt's saying, is I think that you know, I've had the pleasure of working with some, re, you know, in, in the, the inside the Viva Key operation, many great agencies. And the models are obviously very successful. So I'm not trying to pick one or the other. Uh, all those children are beautiful. But what I think all three of them focus on, I think, is where we need the future agency, which is technology, creativity, slash content, and media. And it's the sweet spot of those three components, which is the future agency, the future quote unquote media agency, uh, maybe the future agency model. Um, I'd also say, you know, to, you know, to build on Mr. Flying Cockroach, uh, I think that we live in, I sincerely, sincerely believe, like Rashad, that it's, you know, that the new agency model must be one of open architecture. It must bring in, it must vet and bring in new partners because, you know, the battle cry in our place anymore is no one agency can do it all. And, you know, yeah. I believe in that wholeheartedly. With yeah. that, I yeah. think we're, we're out of time. I'm going to let, it's appropriate, I think, we should let Mr. Clues have the last word. First of oh. all, a big round of applause <laughs> for Jack Clues. And good luck. Thank you. Thank you. You've, made a, uh, you've made a real difference in this industry, Jack. It's, a, it's just been like an to honor to compete with you. It's, a, That's good. it's been an honor to have you kick my butt so many times. <laughs> Thank um, you, uh, and, uh, and then finally, thanks. A round of applause to this fantastic panel. It's been great to be together. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys.